Good morning. Welcome to Pell City First Methodist. I'm Belinda and one of the pastors here and we're glad you've joined us for worship this morning. Have you noticed the nighttime temperatures are a little cooler? High school football is starting in some places. People are actually breaking out the pumpkin spice everything. It's a time of transition. The kids have gone back to school. Uh, and usually we'd be turning a corner into a very busy season here. We're grateful that the COVID-19 numbers seem to be going in the proper direction, which is down. And so we'll be expanding a few opportunities for you for in-person, on-site worship in the coming days. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about those. Our community ecumenical worship service, Chapel in the Pines, which meets at Lakeside Park at 830, has extended its season through October. That's an extra month of outdoor worship for us this fall. And come uh, September 13th, we will be adding a worship service here on the campus of First Methodist in our Beacon, which is our multi-purpose gym facility at 1030 in the morning. I want to refer you to our newsletter this week. If you don't get these already, you can contact the church office so that you might receive it by print or by email. Uh, this will give you all the details you need to know about the new opportunities for worship, study, and service in person and online because we're not gonna stop these online worship services. We understand from you that they are welcomed, appreciated, and really necessary that we continue to spread the message of God's saving love far and wide. This morning as we continue in worship, Byron's gonna bring us a word from 1 Corinthians about worship. He's gonna ask us, what messes up worship? And he's going to have some strong and encouraging words channeling the Apostle Paul about worship. And so we're going to worship through song, through prayer, uh, and the proclamation of God's word this morning. So as we enter more fully into worship, I invite you to go to God in prayer with me. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, we give you thanks for this opportunity we have to join our hearts and spirits, even if we aren't together in body in the same place, that we might join ourselves with you, with one another, with the communion of saints in worship. We thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit, which will help us to hear your word anew, that will help us to have undivided hearts in this time where we might be fully present to you. And so we ask you this day to join us as we join our voices and pray together the way the Lord taught us to pray. We say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen.
So one of the things I'm wondering this morning is what messes up worship for you? I'll give you an example. This past Sunday uh, out at, at, t- at the 10 o'clock service at Lakeside Park, um, we were starting to sing the first song. The praise team was leading. It was an excellent song. Uh, and then all of a sudden my son kind of elbows me and turns and looks. And then, I, and then he draws my attention and I turn and look at, to see everybody in the crowd looking at me. I'm thinking, what's going on? I had forgotten the bulletins. They were in my car. I drove them over there. I intentionally left them there thinking after the chapel and the pine service, I'd go back and get them. And I just left them there. It's not the first time. I've done it before, something like it. Do you know that just about every Sunday that we have done worship out there at 10 o'clock at Chapel in the Pines, we haven't, we haven't invited people to, to give offerings. We've got offering baskets at the front and the back. We just don't even think about it. That's crazy, isn't it? Preachers not asking for offerings. Have you noticed 
that since we've been doing online worship with, uh, since for the pandemic, we haven't asked you for an offering during these worship services either. Now that's a little bit more intentional. Sometimes we mess up in other ways. Have you ever noticed when the preacher, when everybody sang the Lord's Prayer and then the preacher says words that doesn't, it, that, is that what it said? Is, are, are they really saying what they think that they're saying? They've totally gaffed on the words. I've had some people come to me after the worship service and say, can you believe that they don't even know the prayer? I'm thinking, well, no, we know the prayer. It's just that our heads get in so many different places that we mess up sometimes. You do it too. My uh, music director, the, our choir director growing up, Mark, wonderful guy, he's a great friend, but it, you never wanted to watch him when you were singing hymns because he never sang the words. He'd sing some of the words, he'd hit them, some of them on the mark, but some of them he'd be singing, I don't know if he wasn't singing watermelon, but he'd be singing whatever it was that came to his mind because he was thinking about the music, he was thinking about the sound, he was thinking about the people in the pews. There was a lot of different things that were going on. He was just kind of distracted. Worship can be messed up in many different ways. Have you ever been in worship and, uh, and your, your team or the, your enemy's team's fight song goes off in the middle of the worship service? I have, during a funeral. Try that out. That's crazy, isn't it? Or the power goes off, or the microphones don't work, or the piano quit working. Piano quit working? Yeah, sometimes it just kind of breaks. Or the organ doesn't have power, or the choir doesn't show up? Well, maybe not. There's a lot of different things that can go wrong in worship, right? So have you had time to think? What messes up worship for you? See, I think we've been journeying with Paul for a long time, and y'all been really good to kind of go with us uh, through 1 Corinthians as we've been kind of navigating chapter by chapter, mostly chapter by chapter. In chapter 14, in a way, I think Paul is kind of hitting these Corinthians right over the head with this message that says, hey, y'all, this is what messes up worship. He's actually been saying it for a couple of chapters. Remember, chapter 12, 13, and 14 are, are a, a, a grouping. We, uh, we put them all together. In chapter 12, we talked about spiritual gifts, but Paul is really speaking about how spiritual gifts are lived out in worship. Chapter 13, Belinda preached on that this past week, is really kind of the undergirding what it is, how it is that these spiritual gifts, what, it, that what they need, what is necessary in order for them to be functional. And now in chapter 14, he's putting it all together. And so in the very first parts of the chapter, he speaks about speaking in tongues. It's something very foreign to you if you've grown up in the Methodist church. I grew up in a different denomination, and honestly, it's mostly foreign to me too. Now, I had really good friends in Pentecostal movements in the Church of God and the Assemblies of God, and so I have been around uh, movements where, at times where tongues have been spoken, and, um, and it, it was a little bit weird to me. But for them, it was a, it was a, total, uh, it was a total engagement by the Holy Spirit with them. So I didn't discount it at all. It was just a, a uniqueness of their faith uh, over against mine. So Paul starts off this chapter by kind of speaking about speaking in tongues. He had done that in chapter 12 too, remember? When he was ranking the spiritual gifts and every time he ranked the spiritual gifts, it seems like spirit, the tongues were at the bottom. The tongue speakers were saying, hello, where are we? And Paul's saying, yeah, you're at the bottom because you think that you're at the top. And here in chapter 14, he kind of does it again. He speaks to them again about speaking in tongues and basically says to them, okay, y'all, here's some pragmatic ways to do this when we're working together in worship. And it sums, it kind of all wraps up in this one verse. I'm going to just, just going to read one verse from chapter 14 today. And it's verse 26. And Paul says this, what should be done then, my friends? When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. And here's the real nugget. Let all things be done for building up. I could just close the Bible and stop right there. But really, I kind of need to spend a little bit of time on this, don't I? Because Paul spent a little bit of time on it. 
We see the reason why he spoke about speaking in tongues, the gifts of prophecy in tongues. The first 25 uh, verses of this chapter really were about this. In fact, most of chapter 12 were about this. Chapter 13, he mentions the prophecy in tongues as well. He's really been spending a lot of attention and time on the gift of tongues and the interpretation of tongues in worship, right? The reason why is because of this one verse. Let all things be done for building up. For building up. You see, there were some in the Corinthian church who were valuing other, we've heard this before, valuing some gifts over others. Remember the head and the eyes over the hands and the feet. They were valuing the speaking or interpreting of tongues, the prophetic ministry, the words of knowledge over other spiritual gifts. It, which would, I mean, guess how you would feel in that situation. Excluded, missing the mark, God skipped over you, not gifted at all. There's a lot of different feelings that you could feel. Now imagine if your worship service solely consisted of this. And some almost felt competitive as some were speaking in tongues and others were prophesying and some others were speaking in tongues and others Maybe some were not even uh, it translated. There was no one there to translate the prophecies or the, or the tongues. They were just, it was just like this mayhem, madness that was happening in worship. And here you are on the third of the last pew, sitting there wondering, well, what's going on with me? When do I get to participate? And how is this bringing us together? Paul speaks to them and basically says to them, use restraint. He, he actually says this in the verses that follow. Use your strength. If a couple people want to speak in tongues, do it. Wait your turn. Stand in line. If you've got a prophetic word to say, do it. But be silent while somebody else is prophesying. And then he says this word that is really troubling to us 21st century Christians. He says, women, be silent in church. Something like that. And go and ask your husbands when you get home. I'm paraphrasing. But that's kind of how we do with Paul. We hear the words, we kind of dismiss them, and we, and we say, well, that's not what he meant. Well, no, it, I think it kind of is what he meant. There are some scholars that would want to dismiss this totally. In fact, the translation that I read from today, if you read further and see that passage, they put it in parentheses, this place where he speaks about women being silent in the church. Some scholars think that uh, it was an editor later who came back, not Paul himself, but somebody later who came back through and put this in here so that it would mesh more with what he said later in 1 Timothy or in some of the pastoral letters. I don't know that I agree with that. So usually the simplest explanation is the, is the best one. And the simplest explanation in Corinth was worship was a mess. They were misusing the Lord's table they were misusing spiritual gifts. They were misusing their voices. And Paul was saying to these women who were be, really being disruptive in worship, hey, y'all, just don't talk. Yeah, they weren't talking, they weren't sharing recipes and they weren't saying, amen, preach, brother. If they were saying preach, brother, he would have probably said, bring it. But instead, they were probably interrupting in worship, asking theological questions asking questions that, honestly, they had probably never had the freedom to ask in worship before or regarding God before. And now that they had been given this newfound freedom in Christ, wouldn't you want to use it too? And so they probably were. That's my guess. I don't know. I may be wrong. And so Paul says, hey, y'all, just stay quiet when you're, when you're here. Go home and later you can talk about it when you're there. Because when it happens in worship, what it leads to is disruption. Right? Now, have you ever been in a worship service where a preacher asked a question? I'm one of those preachers. I've asked questions before. You may have heard me ask questions before. Now, we want you to answer when we ask questions because it's kind of you know, a little bit embarrassing if we ask a question and nobody answers. But when we didn't ask a question and you're throwing in stuff, feedback, well, that doesn't necessarily build up, right? So if I said, hey, what was your favorite song growing up? 
or tell me your favorite hymn or how has God met, met you in life today? And you answer, then I'd say, oh, thank you for participating. But if we're just going knee deep in the scripture and preaching and trying to connect people with God's word and with Jesus, and then out from out of the blue, somebody raises their hand and says, hey, preacher, let's talk about this for a second. Well, wouldn't that throw you off a little bit? It would me. I'm pretty flexible. So I think what Paul is saying here to the Corinthians, first he speaks about tongues and prophecies. Later he speaks about other things, almost like a litany of, of how, we do, how we should do worship. If you could boil it all down, it boils down in, chap, in verse 26. Remember what that said? Let all things be done for building up. So, I want to reframe the question that I asked you at the very beginning. Remember, what messes up worship for you? What messes up worship for me? It's usually, honestly, the stuff that messes up worship for me are the times when I misspeak and, uh, hey, Google uh, pastor misspeaking, and you can find tons of preachers on the internet who have said inappropriate things at inappropriate times during sermons, okay? It happens. The things that, we're, that disrupt my worship, that really mess, mess with my worship, are when I mess up. It bugs me when I mess up the words to the Lord's Prayer. It, bugs, it bugged me when I had to run to my car and get the bulletins last week. Those things mess with me. But do you know what the thing that Paul is saying really messes with us? Because the stuff that messes with you might be different. The things that mess up your worship, ruin it, taint it. It may be that they played the hymn too fast. Organ was a little too loud. The bass, uh, the bass was, was a little bit out of sync with the drums. Or the tenors were a little bit syncopated when they should have been in line. The things that mess up our worship t sometimes are somebody sat next to us that was supposed to be sitting in a different row. Or, um, or they showed up at a different time and it totally kind of threw us off. The things that mess up our worship sometimes are when we take up the offering at a different time, when we change the order a little bit, and then we find, oh my gosh, I don't even know if I worship today. And sometimes we even say, my worship is messed up when the preacher preaches a bad sermon. Well, we're going to preach bad sermons. It happens. And thanks be to God, you know, this has been the miraculous thing about preaching. Even when we preach bad sermons, God does something redeeming with that. And sometimes I've preached some of my worst sermons and people come back later and say, thank you. And I'm thinking, for what? I was going to throw that one away. They said, well, God spoke to me doing that. Remember, remember this, the worst preacher in the Bible, Jonah, had the best had the best response. The whole town turned. He didn't even care. He didn't even want to do it. So yes, bad sermons can mess up your worship, but the, the stuff that really messes up worship, listen to what Paul said, the places where our worship really gets thrown off kilter is when it doesn't build up. That's what Paul's been trying to say for a long time in this letter and I guess you've been saying, you've been trying to say this for a long time in the sermon. Yes. Paul's been trying to tell the Corinthians, and he's really trying to tell us today in the 21st century as well. Our worship gets distorted, gets distracted, gets messed up, and messes up others when, when it stops building up and it starts tearing down. That's almost it. What can you do in worship? Many things. You can speak, you can sing, you can read, you can write poetry, you can use art, you can dance, you can move, you can do a lot of different things in worship. But the one thing that we can't do, or we shouldn't do, we should avoid at all costs, is that we should, shouldn't tear down. That our worship shouldn't tear down the fabric of the community, but instead that it should build it together. 
Now, I want you to hear me in saying this. That does not mean that we don't say, that we never say difficult things. It's not, it doesn't mean that we don't, that we, that we always do the stuff that makes us happy. We're going to sing hymns in minor keys, and we're going to hear sermons that sound very prophetic. We're going to have our toes stepped on, whether we're Democrats or Republicans, whether we're Alabama or Auburn fans, or even Arkansas fans. We're going to, we're going to be upset by worship, and we're going to continually be upset by worship the closer we get to God. Because the closer we get to God, the more that we want our heart to be like God's heart. And the more that we want, sincerely want, not just what we want and desire and need in worship, but the more that we find ourselves wanting what is going to build up. Not, not people. I'm not talking about putting people in seats and putting dollars in the bank account, okay? Here, don't hear me wrong. Building up God's kingdom, transforming, changing individual lives and changing communities. The closer we get to God, the more that we want our worship to be like that, to build up community. Now, repeatedly, Paul has said to the Corinthians, when I came there, you were like babies and you're still like babies. I'm going to treat you like one. Now, God love them. We hope that they grew up. And I really do think that some of them did. Because here we are, almost 20 centuries later, still proclaiming the name of Jesus. And you know why? Because of people like them. People who messed up, people who tore it down, people who got it wrong, people who made it all about them, who eventually understood that it's really all about Jesus. So, what is it that messes up our worship? Well, we do. Others can when we tear down and when we don't build up. But if our worship is about building up, building up others, building up the community of faith and building up the communities in which we live, then you've got to know that God is going to continue to bless it. And God is going to show up, not in a building, but in our lives. So, as we contemplate and consider and continue to think about the stuff, the ways that we get things wrong, the next time your preacher messes up, which will probably be in about 10 seconds, don't get sidetracked by that and don't think about how bad they are and don't think about how ill-equipped they are to lead the church, but instead think of their heart, of the musician, of the singer, of the ones who prepared worship, of the ones who set out the bulletins or who printed it out, and think, are they trying to build us up? Are they trying to tear us down? And brothers and sisters, I tell you, if, if they're trying to build you up, then you need to go with it. You need to trust that God is going to be in our worship, whether it's in your household, sitting on your couch, walking around a walking track, or sitting in a sanctuary. God is going to be here. God is going to be here. So um, I just want to say thanks be to God. Uh, so let me pray for you. Um, Lord, thank you for drawing us into this space to worship today. Lord, we are thankful for the opportunities that we have had through online expressions of worship and through in-person expressions of worship to, to build up your kingdom here on earth, to build up individual disciples and to build up the communities in which we live. Lord, keep us laser focused on that. Help us to always be working toward building up instead of tearing down. In Jesus' name, amen.
So, we have gathered together to worship. People scattered and gathered as the community of God. We shared our prayers with one another. We've sang our praises with one another. We've heard scripture proclaimed. And now we get sent out into the world. I want you to know that God doesn't send us in, just keep us in worship and say that our worship should build up. But you know what? Our lives should do it too. So, may the God who formed us who breathed life into us, and who saves us. Send us now into the world, continually redeeming us and this world as we seek to build up those around us and build up the communities in which we live, build up this wonderful country in which we live, and build up all of creation. Lord, keep us focused on you. Help us to follow you with everything we've got. We pray all this in your name. Amen.